Welcome to Friday's edition of COVID-19. We're ending the work week with a drop in daily cases, but Prime Minister Chong se gyun is urging against travel during the upcoming Lunar New Year holiday, stressing that the third wave remains a threat. And speaking of travel, restrictions against it have dealt a severe blow to the global tourism industry, as our panel of experts will tell us later on in the program. But first, here's our Kwon Soa. Soa, let's begin here in Korea for this Friday. Well, Sonny, we have a decline by around 80 cases compared to yesterday as we're heading into the weekend with 370 infections. With domestic transmissions having dropped to the mid-300s and we also have 19 imported cases. Now, the average number of daily infections in the past week stands between 362 and 363. Uh, there are slight discrepancies and that likely due to revisions made to daily uh, infections infections in recent days. Now, despite today's drop, Korea has surpassed 80,000 infections in total as of this Friday, being the country with the 86th highest number of infections around the world. Now, as of 12 a.m., the exact figure stands at 80,131. But also what's good to see is that the number of recoveries has surpassed 70,000 this Friday. Right, so Anna, despite the drop today, I understand there are actual concerns and they are growing with less than a week left to the Lunar New Year holiday. Right, Sunny. It's one of the two major holidays here in Korea where a mass of traveling is involved. And uh, that, of course, increases the risk of viral infections. Prime Minister Chong se gyun today cited a survey saying that three out of four adults have no plans to visit their hometowns. But he also mentioned this. Even under such an atmosphere, accommodations at major tourist hotspots have been fully booked, with some people planning to go on vacations instead of visiting their hometowns. We mustn't let our hopes riding on treatments and vaccines loosen our guard. And that's also why places like Jeju Island here are having concerns because that is one of the places, the tourist spots that Chong se gyun the Prime Minister, just mentioned, as well as civil workers are concerned uh, who are going to conduct special uh, inspections over the holidays at restaurants and coffee shops, especially to see whether people are abiding by the ban on private gatherings of five or more people. Now, if we take a look at our map, we have uh, 12 provinces or major cities that uh, are seeing new confirmed cases this Friday, and we do not want to see those scattered across the nation after the holiday. Now, while Korea will soon kick off its uh, vaccination program, uh, there is also some news coming in on the local treatment front. As one of Korea's domestic uh, companies, there's been a conditional approval on one of the treatments for COVID-19. And uh, now we have data from multiple international uh, sources showing that the number of people around the world who got already vaccine shots has outnumbered the total number of infections around the world. Now, one of the vaccine makers, AstraZeneca, meanwhile, said that it is uh, hoping to have a new vaccine for COVID-19 variants by autumn. And also in response to questions over the efficacy of AstraZeneca in elderly people here in Korea, Korea's drug regulator says more discussion is needed before administrating those to people aged 65 and older. Now, if we take a look at the infection number here, 105.4 million, that number as of noon Korea time might be similar to the total number of vaccinations around the world uh, by this time. And uh, we also have almost 2.3 million fatalities from the virus. And let's take a detailed look at the numbers of my major outbreaks. We have the U.S. at 27.2 million. Uh, the U.S. has some over 120,000 new infections, while Brazil also reported almost 60,000 new cases, now standing at 9.39 million. And we also see Indonesia here with over 11,000 new cases reported in the past day. And those are the updates I have for now. Have a safe weekend and I'll be back on Monday. Sonny? All right, so I'll see you next week. Up next, we turn to the latest on Korea's vaccination campaign, which will be launched later this month with frontline healthcare workers among the first to be inoculated. I have Kim Sung-yeon here in the studio with details on our vaccination campaign. Right, Sung-yeon? Yes, uh, good afternoon.
Right, Songyan. Now, Korea has adopted, I understand, a two-track strategy for the distribution of vaccines later this month. Right, uh, Sunny. It's a two-track strategy uh, that is necessary, and this is due to the different storage requirements for each vaccine depending on its maker. So, for instance, mRNA vaccines like Pfizer's or Moderna's, uh, they will be given at specialized vaccination centers with ultra-low temperature freezers, uh, while the other vaccines, they will be given at designated medical centers. Now, now, Korea's vaccination program is slated to begin later this month, as you mentioned, and questions are being asked by the public on where uh, they can get their shots. So far, the government has secured vaccines from four different companies, uh, Moderna, Pfizer, AstraZeneca, and Janssen. And Korea is also nearing a supply deal with Novavax. Now, according to the Korea Disease Control and Prevention Agency, mRNA vaccines like Pfizer's and Moderna's, uh, they will be administered at specialized vaccination centers equipped with with ultra low temperature freezers. Now other vaccines will be handed out at some 10,000 te uh, designated medical centers, including your neighborhood clinics and local hospitals where you also get your flu shots. Now this is because mRNA vaccines have very demanding storage requirements which call for specialized infrastructure. Uh, Pfizer vaccines are highly sensitive to temperature as we know and need to be stored at below minus 70 degrees Celsius while uh, it is minus 20 degrees for Moderna. Hence, the ultra-low temperature freezers will be installed at each of these vaccination centers, and the government plans to set up 250 such vaccination centers throughout the country by July of this year. Right. Now, Songyun, I hear there's also a two-track policy for the shipping of these vaccines. Right. Uh, Sunny, the shipping process, you can understand, it, of the vaccines is um, actually very uh, complex, uh, especially given the wide variety of the COVID-19 vaccines uh, in Korea, which will need to be transported to 250 vaccination centers, along with the other uh, 10,000 medical centers as well. Now, the two-track strategy in the shipping process will depend on their country of origin, meaning either locally produced vaccines or those manufactured overseas. For example, local firm SK Bioscience has a licensing deal to produce AstraZeneca vaccines here at home. So in this case, a local shipping company will be in charge of transporting these vaccines, sending the vaccines to designated medical centers via an integrated distribution center. Meanwhile, in the case of imported vaccines that have been produced abroad, the foreign manufacturer can transport the vaccines directly to a medical center here or a local shipping firm can store the vaccines at an integrated distribution center first uh, prior to sending them over to the vaccination center. I see. Songyun, the COVAX facility has shared its uh, vaccine distribution plan. Please tell us more. Right. Uh, COVAX has set out its plan for global distribution, and we are talking about of some 337 million vaccines, and 145 countries around the world will be receiving the doses that are proportional to their population size. Now, uh, those vaccines will be distributed in the first half of the year and cover around 3.3% of their total population. Now, announcing the distribution plan in a virtual press briefing on Wednesday, the COVAX facility said that 336 million doses of the AstraZeneca vaccine and 1.2 million doses of the Pfizer vaccine will be allocated. The release of the distribution forecast came amid concerns over whether lower income countries will be left out of the immunization race uh, dominated by the rich nations, which is a problem COVAX was set up to resolve. And now governments around the world can start preparing to roll out COVID-19 vaccines to their populations. And with these allocations announced today, uh, we are on the path to really start balancing out a global map. Now, experts say the framework has reached a critical moment in efforts to address the growing disparity in vaccine rollouts worldwide. A wealthy self-financing countries were on the list, in addition to the lower-income nations, including South Korea. And through COVAX, Korea is expected to receive at least 2.7 million COVID-19 vaccine doses in the first half of this year. And among them, Korea will get at least 117,000 doses of the Pfizer vaccine and over 2.5 million doses of the AstraZeneca vaccine produced locally by SK Bioscience. Now, keeping in mind the two-dose requirement for both vaccines, they will be enough to inoculate over 1.3 million people here in Korea. All right, Songyun, as always, thank you very much for that coverage. Thank you for having me.
Right, there's a place of traditional arts here in Capitals Hall that's turning to modern technology to allow for a safe cultural experience amid the pandemic. Our Chon Song Cho is there right now. Hello, Song Cho. Good afternoon, Song Yan. Right, so Song Cho, where is this place? All right, so I'm at the National Kugang Museum uh, uh, for Korean Traditional Music, which is in fact located just across the street uh, from the Arirang TV station in southern Seoul. So today, I'm not alone. Uh, I'm with a buddy named QI. So he's an AI robot who just started working here since last Tuesday as a curator or a museum docent, whatever you want to call him, a guide. So his job is to not only provide general information uh, and information services to the visitors here, such as like showing the map of the museum or uh, showing us the direction to the restroom, but he also can offer explanation and information about the collection at the museum. And what's great about him is that he, since he's a robot, he can't get infected with COVID-19. He can't pass around the virus. So when I'm talking to him, I don't have to worry about social distancing or catching the virus from him. So um, it's no surprise that he's getting really, really popular these days uh, since we're in the middle of a pandemic and local museums are really trying trying their best to maintain business as usual without the risk of COVID-19 spread. And so since I'm here, um, I'm going to show you what the conversation with him looks like. So I'm going to speak in English. He can speak in various languages like Korean, English, Chinese, and Japanese. So I'm going to say, hi, QI. It's going to activate. Okay. What's the weather like today? All right, so he's using his brilliant AI brain to look up on the information. What is the weather like today? We will inform you of the current weather forecast. The temperature in this place where I am is 10.0 degrees and the weather is forecast to be cloudy. Okay, so the temperature indoor is 10 degrees. That's a piece of information that I didn't know about. And what's also great about him is that he has a screen which people don't have. That means we can actually look up on information while watching video clips. It can give us a visual explanation. So let's, for instance, I want to learn more about Kugak. So uh, what is Techita music? So I press on this icon, then see, it has all this explanation. Oh, excuse me. Let's go back. So learn more about Kugak, Techita music. So it gives you all the explanation and it gives you a video clip of the actual performance and that can really help us better understand about the music, right? So it's so much better than just uh, listening to the audio guide and it can actually also give us a tour of the museum. So tell me the history of Kugak, Pansori and Changguk. So it will actually move, start move. <laughs> Yeah, it is. It just started moving, and then it's gonna show us around the museum. So I don't know. I feel kind of. It feels kind of surreal being toured, being guided by a AI robot, and it almost feels like a sci-fi movie for me. So yes, these are all these amazing features that the robot has. And for more on his brilliant talent, I'm going to talk to one of the officials here. Hi, thank you for joining our show. Thank you for coming. All right, so he's great. Um, how did you come about the idea of hiring him at the museum? Uh, since the foundation of the museum in 1995, we have tried to uh, help visitors and audiences experience and get a good feeling for Korean traditional music and dance in interesting and effective ways. Uh, as an example, in this uh, pandemic situation, we came up with the idea that uh, Robert could work as a curator in place of a human curator uh, so that the guests uh, wouldn't have to worry about social distancing. Yes. All right. So what has been the feedback from the visitors like? Um, do they actually find him helpful? 
Yes, people, uh, especially children, love the rabbit. When a child talks to the rabbit, it uses the facial recognition to detect the speaker's age, and it determines that it is talking to a child, uh, and it adjusts uh, its dialogue accordingly. So uh, the children spend a lot of time talking and playing with it. And the, uh, well, as you may have seen it, uh, the rabbit could walk a child to the restroom. And the rabbit uh, speaks several languages and uh, even uses sign language for the hearing impaired. Uh, Actually, the Ministry of Culture, uh, Sports and Tourism has developed the rabbit for use uh, by different cultural agencies, and we submitted a proposal uh, for a rabbit uh, curator, and our uh, proposal was accepted. So fortunately, we have this rabbit, and people love it. I see I can picture kids having so much fun with the robot and it will not only enhance the learning experience for the kids but also people with um, impairment, disimpairment. Uh, impairment. Thank you so much for joining our show. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> wow, so the wonders of technology, right? I mean, technology cannot prevent the onset of a pandemic but it can definitely help prevent the spread and also um, educate and empower people and most noticeably lessen the impact of the pandemic. So with the help of QI, I'm going to finish the rest of the exhibit here at the National Gugat Museum. This has been Chan Song Cho and back to you guys in the studio. Song Cho, our greetings to your friend right there and also thank you for that report. Uh, to our viewers, we also do apologize for the slight disruption in connection there. Now staying on the cultural scene, the musical Cats is marking its 40th anniversary here in Korea since its opening in London's West End back in 1981. One. Now, this production is perhaps among the very few that has been able to meet its audience live on stage amid the pandemic. I have a member of the cast, Thomas Injay, on the line right now. Pleasure to have you with us, Thomas. Hi, Sunny. Thank you for having me on. Right, Thomas, let's begin with a little bit of information about your role in the musical yes. Cats. Yeah, so I play McCavity and Admetus in Cats the Musical. I actually have a few figurines from the show here. Uh, this is Mr. Mistopheles with me right now, and also the Ron Tom Tugger as well. Uh, Thomas, despite the COVID-19 yes. restrictions elsewhere around the world, the curtains have gone up for the sixth straight month for your show here in Korea. How do you feel? Yeah, it's amazing. We're really, really lucky. I know um, South Korea are sort of paving the way for theatre around the world at the moment with the show. Um, we are so lucky that we've been able to meet the audiences live on stage. Um, and we all feel extremely lucky to, to have jobs and have work. Thomas, tell us a bit about the rehearsals and the performances amid the social distancing guidelines here. Yeah, we had quite a, a journey to get to South Korea. Um, we are a cast made up of Australians, um, English, uh, Americans, South Africans and Koreans. So we were all brought together and quarantined for two weeks. Um, and then on leaving quarantine, we then went straight into rehearsals. And it's a really strict process to obviously keep safety measures in place, social distancing, um, constant testing and temperature checks. Uh, so we were then put into rehearsals together for six weeks and then we were open the show in Seoul back in September. That's quite amazing. What have been some of the more tangible changes in actual performance uh, owing to COVID-19 prevention measures, Thomas? Yeah, so I performed in Cats the last time it was in South Korea three years ago, and there have been huge changes, obviously. Um, some of the sort of notable changes, there's a lot of audience interaction in the show, and obviously we've had to take some of that out to keep everyone safe. But what's really lovely, we've got some of the originality still in the show, um, and we've actually managed to make masks with our Cats makeup painted on them, so we can have some of the cast in the audience um, but still keeping safe and, and keeping everyone safe. Um, we've also got social distancing in place. If the audience are too close to the stage, we don't sell those tickets. So it really is a very safe place to be. And it's just wonderful that we can still perform and keep everyone safe as well. Right. Thomas, while theatres here in Korea are fortunately open, those in the US and the UK remain closed. What are your thoughts on this unfortunate reality? <laughs> It's awful. I mean, it's really hard to read back home, obviously friends and family that aren't currently in, in work because of this. Um, 
I feel disheartened, but I also feel some sense of hope because South Korea have proved it can work. So if it can work here, it should work everywhere else. Um, and I think South Korea are sort of a beacon of hope for theatre around the world. Thomas, aside from your experience on stage, what has your daily life off stage here in Korea been like? Yeah, I mean, it's very different to how it was last time. Obviously, we can't party, we can't drink. And that is, a, you know, obviously something that we have missed, that sort of party side. Um, we've been taking our temperatures constantly. We fill out diaries so we know exactly where we've been. So it's all this contact tracing just to keep everyone safe. Um, I think the main thing this time, it's about the show. We want to keep the show open. We want to keep people safe. So that is our priority. And as much as we want to see and enjoy the country that is South Korea, which is so wonderful, it really is about keeping safe. Thomas, before you go then, do you have any words that you would like to share with your fans here, including my daughter who was there three years ago to show you on, to see oh. on stage? That is. <laughs> I do. I want to say thank you so much for supporting us and coming to see the show. It's been amazing. We've loved meeting you and we hope to meet many more of you. All right, Thomas, thank you very much for making the time thank to join so us live much. at this time. Thank you, Sunny. Travel restrictions to curb COVID-19 have dealt a crippling blow to the global tourism industry. For more in its current plight and its post-pandemic future, I have Professor Pei So Young from Kyunghee University. Welcome to the program, Professor Pei. Good afternoon. And joining our talk virtually from Spain is Sandra Caval from the UN World Tourism Organization. Welcome to the program, Ms. Caval. Hello, good afternoon to everyone. Right, Professor Be, let's begin with perhaps your grim assessment of the toll of the pandemic on the global tourism industry. Well, yes, in the modern society, traveling is actually not an option, something essential and universal in our daily life. However, this COVID-19 situation has brought a significant physical restrictions of traveling. Unlike the other infectious diseases, such as like swine flu, Ebola, or MERS, they were primarily regionally oriented. But COVID-19 actually swept across the entire world, and over 90% of the world population has been restricted from the travel. So even though in Korea, we did not actually have the strict border closure or compulsory um, travel restrictions, but still the number of the individual travels has been dramatically reduced because of their fear and anxiety and then substantial changes of their daily life. And this reduced travel activity itself actually caused another emotional toll, such as depression and anger called like Corona blue or even Corona red. And obviously it's brought a significant amount of economic crisis in the entire tourism industry in various sectors such as travel, air, and cruise and mice industry and duty-free or casino and many more. So lots of tourism enterprises actually has been through um, restructuring of the organization. And sadly enough, a lot of the entities actually have shut down their business. I see. Meanwhile, Ms. Kavao, your agency recently published a report on the status, status that is, on the world's tourism industry in the wake of the pandemic. Do tell us a bit about your findings. 
I think, uh, as it was mentioned, we are reliving uh, an unprecedented situation in, in its wideness of impact um, globally, but also on the depth that it has on the markets. Um, according to our latest figures, we have lost 74% of international tourist arrivals last year. If you look at the worst year that we had before, which is 2009 during the economic crisis, International tourist arrivals had declined by 4%. So imagine a 74% decline compared to that number. Just to give you an idea, we're back to the levels of international tourism travel that we had 30 years ago. Um, in 2019, we reached 1.5 billion international tourist arrivals. 2020 ended with around 380. So this is the magnitude of the impact that we are seeing in terms of, of tourism. More than that, tourism is a key element in the exports of many, many countries and obviously one of the most um, job intensive sectors in the world. So UNWTO is estimating that up to 120 million jobs are at risk with this pandemic. And this is one of our major concerns is the impact that it has on small businesses. Tourism is made 80% of small businesses with little capacity to readjust, um, little capacity to keep so long closed with no income. Um, and obviously the human um, impact is huge. Right. And keeping in mind what Ms. Carval has just said, I'm assuming the impact, of course, on the local tourism industry has also been quite severe. Professor Bay, please tell us a bit about that as well. Well, the situation is pretty much similar to the global context. So back in 2019, actually the inbound tours, the number, it was over 18 million inbound tourists. And in one single year, it's been dropped to 2 million. So it's a significant impact actually. But despite this crisis, there was actually one thing that needs special attention, the impact of the successful K quarantine. Because um, a lot of different uh, countries, they have been praised for this prompt and um, systematic handling of COVID-19 situations of Korean government. So it actually brought a positive image and reputation of this country. So I think it will be a great fundamental asset for the tourism industry after the COVID-19, I mean the post-corona era. I see. So we have a little bit of a silver lining there then. Ms. Carval, what is your evaluation of Korea's containment of the pandemic as observed from a tourism perspective? Um, I think we, we can't never forget that this is far most um, a health crisis. So obviously the way that the health crisis is managed is critical in, in the process of the tourism uh, recovery and also in, in its future. Um, I think obviously it's Korea's um, testing capacity, uh, tracing capacity has been uh, very effective as we've seen uh, just listening to your, your numbers earlier on on the program. Um, and that's a very important factor. Uh, also the fact that um, some of the limitations that we're seeing on the domestic tourism in many countries have not occurred there for now. So I think um, it, it is the key point that um, many organizations have made and our sister organization, WHO, the capacity to um, test, trace and, and treat are critical in, in this situation and critical to the recovery of sectors such as tourism. I see. Professor Bay, a study you conducted revealed a shift in travel perceptions mm -hmm. among Koreans in light of the pandemic. Please tell us a bit about the shift. Absolutely. So our recent study actually was initiated from my personal curiosity back in March 2020, right after the pandemic was announced. So this, because of this corona, there has been lots of restrictions of traveling. And I asked myself, OK, so interpersonal contact is inherent in tourism industry. Then the needs of traveling from the public's perspectives, would it, will, will it be, I mean, the gone, the disappear? Or um, would they make travel at least actually in an alternative format? Actually, at the very beginning, people were just so anxious and frightened because of the fear and anxiety during this pandemic. So they did not travel ever. But later, they figure out that this pandemic situation has prolonged. So they decided like, okay, I will try to establish my own criteria for safe enough travel and I'll try to make tourism, but in a very safe manner. And in my recently published article, I define it as untech tourism. 
And then my study finding demonstrated that the more individuals perceive the risk of COVID-19, the more actually people have positive attitude to the Antec tourism and also more intention to make Antec tourism instead of not going. I see, and I'll, I'll ask you a little bit about the Antec tourism in a little bit. But first, Ms. Carval, there's also been a change in travel trends in response to COVID-19 movement restrictions. What are some of these trends? Well, I think, um, as it was mentioned uh, in the early moments, there was a significant concern about the impact of the pandemic. So we did see a, a, a full closure as, as um, the possibilities of traveling uh, emerged, particularly in inside countries. We, we have seen a huge immense um, demand for domestic tourism. Um, and at this point, I'd like to, to point the fact that in many countries, actually, domestic tourism income and volume is even higher than international tourism and it is a segment that is often forgotten um, and it has a huge potential so we have seen domestic tourism growing significantly we have seen um, an appetite for um, open air um, experiences rural tourism nature um, and that uh, in the context of obviously the concerns of being in closed spaces and also the need after the lockdowns to have a closer contact with nature we've also also seen an important trend in terms of bookings, which is um, as a consequence of the changing travel restrictions, um, the trend is to book shorter uh, times between your travel date and your decision to travel, because obviously you don't know if you will be allowed to travel. And also as a consequence of that, people are much more concerned about travel cancellation policies. We have seen when the crisis emerged, uh, a big issue about refunding of cancellation travel. Uh, now people want to make sure that they can cancel their travel without any uh, consequences. At the same time, um, I've, there was also in terms of segments, um, uh, wider demand for travel among younger generations, uh, which is natural in terms of the concerns of health that um, uh, senior segments might have. Um, so for destinations, it is important to understand those changes and be able to, first of all, connect and keep the conversation going online with the travelers, um, because there is a huge pent up demand. We do see whenever there's good news like the vaccination or when we see uh, travel restrictions being somehow um, diminished, that people start booking. So it is important for destinations and for companies to keep um, that connection with the consumers and to understand how the shifts are uh, being made. Right. Now, Professor Bay, going back to what you said earlier, the untagged tourism, is it? Can you tell us a bit about this? Okay, so I'd like to explain it in the context of two different points, so offline and online. So actually, as Chief Sandra just mentioned, domestic uh, potential for domestic tourism, it's actually huge. So the first segment of untapped tourism could be the offline version of travel, but in a very safe manner by minimizing uh, contact with other people, such as like camping or spending time in the green spaces or try to use like exclusive accommodations, like family only type. And the other segment of Antic tourism can be online version. Sometimes we call it as like digital tour, online tour or landline tour or virtual tourism as well. So basically it's about like consuming content related to travel, but in a virtual setting or in an online setting. So we have the desire to travel, but we do not want to expose ourselves into the risk. So it's kind of an alternative option to enjoy the travel experience, but in a safe manner. But from my point of view, even though this second type of online tourism or virtual tourism, it can be a great alternative for the actual travel experience. But ultimately, it will not be very easy to replace the actual travel experience. I know, it would be difficult yeah. to replace the sights and sounds of actual places. D definitely. Right. Ms. Kavao, your agency recently granted Korea's southern resort island of Jeju high marks for safe travel despite COVID-19. Do tell us a bit more about this acknowledgement. 
Thank you. I think the important principles when we restart travel is obviously safety and security as uh, one of the prime objectives, um, not only to provide consumers with the confidence to travel, but also to protect um, the workers and to protect the populations. Um, Jeju Tourism Organization is a UNWTO affiliate member. Um, and also for us, we are always looking at innovative ways of uh, dealing with, uh, with the pandemic and making sure that travel can restart in a safe way. So UNWTO has acknowledged the efforts that Jeju Tourism has been doing in terms of ensuring that safety and security at the airport, but also um, the real-time information that is provided in terms of uh, the congestion of the sites, which actually allows consumers to take um, a decision, a conscience, an informed decision on when they can go and what they can do in the island. Um, I think it's also an example of um, the use of technology. This is one of the key elements that we consider will help us restart tourism in a safe way. And also, um, we have seen during this pandemic that we have probably accelerated in six months what we would see um, in technological changes in six years. So we need more and more technological solutions that actually allow us to si uh, safely travel. Right. Professor Bay, there is also belief that the inoculation campaign that is currently underway across in many parts of the world will pave the path to a full resumption of international travel in the near future. Do you share this optimism? Well, sometimes it's, it can be yes or no. Definitely vaccination, it's a great news. But because of this significant amount of crisis of tourism industry, it will obviously take time to recover. So we will need to see what it's going to happen. I see. Ms. Kaval, what efforts are being made by the UNWTO to better support the tourism industry this year as it seeks to recover from the losses back in the year 2020? Well, we have started early in March when, when the crisis um, emerged. Our Secretary General, Mr. Volokashvili, has started um, an important um, initiative, which is the Global Tourism uh, Crisis Committee, which brings together as a unique platform the United Nations agencies, the tourism ministers, and the private sector associations. Because one of the lessons from this crisis is we need to collaborate, we need to create common frameworks, um, because without that, it's impossible to get tourism recovering. Uh, we have issued a series of recommendations to governments, uh, very much oriented to the importance of safeguarding um, the survival of companies with financial incentives, with support schemes, but also of jobs. Um, we have also worked on safety and security protocols since May, and we are working now on the ground with many of our member states, with our countries, to help them implement those safety and security protocols. At the same time, we're supporting the countries in uh, preparing for rebound. How? In education, in technological transformation, uh, with data and real-time information, so they can see where some of the green shoots can come and act very quickly. Um, and finally, um, our Secretary General has been, um, whenever possible, visiting countries and talking to the highest level, to the prime ministers, to the presidents, to actually call for a coordinated approach to um, tourism, because at the end of the day, without national coordination, uh, it will be impossible to then step up that international framework. That is true. Ms. Carval, what is the UNWTO's stance on the adoption of vaccine passports? Uh, one of the critical challenges we face at this time is the safe reopening of cross-border travel. Uh, I would say um, our surveys show that travel restrictions are the main um, obstacle to reassuming uh, safe travel. So there are three things that we need to do um, to advance the safe reopening of borders. First of all is to agree on common criteria uh, on risk assessment. So that all the countries and for example in the European Union there's already a common criteria definition on where countries are classified. Based on that, we need to agree on common protocols. So for each of the, the situations, agree that the protocol to be applied would be A, B, or C. 
Um, and this is also something that from the UN WTO we've been calling very strongly is for countries to coordinate those kind of protocols. Um, and the third part is um, when we talk about risk mitigation measures, um, obviously testing is one of them, the vaccine will be another, um, but it cannot be seen in isolation, first of all, because it cannot be a discriminatory factor for travel. Second of all, because we are seeing that obviously the rollout of the vaccine will take its time. And also it's not available for the whole world as, as we speak. Um, on the other hand, it is important and um, many organizations, including WHO, are working on the certification of a vaccine independently of the purpose. You need to have a certificate that you have been vaccinated. So I think um, we need to, to consider all the risk mitigation measures um, as a layer approach. Um, it will not be one or another. It will be a combination of, of safety and security measures, including the masks, which you know will not disappear uh, with the fact that the vaccination is being rolled out or the social distances or the respect for any other safety measures. Right. Professor Pei, what are some of the more practical measures to support the local tourism industry meanwhile? Well, the government has implemented various policies to fully support the tourism industry. But considering the severity of this crisis, I think um, the government need to provide some ongoing effective solutions. The first, continuous financial support for employment and also tax relief or interest-free loans would be very much essential to protect tourism entities. Especially as the chief Sandra mentioned, the travel industry is composed of lots of small, med medium-sized uh, tourism enterprises, and sometimes they are not even eligible for the adequate governmental support. So we need the particular attention to this small, medium-sized enterprises. And the second of all, diplomatic effort to expand the travel bubble need to be mentioned. So if we have travel bubble, then the quarantine will not be required for travelers, which will extend a lot of freedom for mobility much more. So exclusive to travel bubble partnership with other countries where the corona situations gets more s stabilized, then uh, it will absolutely try to help revitalize the tourism industry at an international level. And actually, I need to also mention that it's directly related to the survival of airline industry as well. That is true. Ms. Kava, when do you suppose will we see or will the global tourism industry, that is, witness a full recovery? I understand that's a difficult question, though. It is the crystal gazing ball question. Um, I think that this pandemic has also shown us that forecasting has become more and more complicated and we, we do live in a very volatile situation. Um, I think there's two factors. One, there is um, an immense pent up demand. There is people really are eager to return to travel. And as I mentioned, we see that whenever the, the conditions are there. But at the same time, we need to have into consideration also um, the challenging situation in terms of, uh, of, of the virus, of the variants that we've seen. Um, we have done a survey among experts that we've consulted to guide us through um, the trends in the travel industry. And we've done this, this um, consultation since 2003. And we asked them, when do they expect a recovery? Um, and most uh, would tell us that um, the full uh, extent of what we had in 2019 in terms of volume will not be reached be before 2023-24. So coming back to pre-pandemic levels will take us um, at least two to three years. I think we need to realize that um, also, as it was mentioned, so that we support the companies, we support the jobs, because otherwise um, they will be um, many, many um, people unemployed, a huge impact on the sector. Um, and at the same time, um, there is an important issue, which is consumers are changing. So we need to understand that and we need to take advantage of all the opportunities to, to rebound the sector. Um, also, we can't forget that economically the pandemic has had an impact. So we will have to see how that uh, shapes the family's spending, how that shaped the decisions that companies will take in terms of business travel. Um, so there are many unknown factors, but I think the positive line is that there is a significant pent-up demand from consumers. Right.
Professor Peer, do you believe the travel perceptions and trends noted during this pandemic will continue to be popular post-pandemic? Well, uh, even in the post-corona era, some of the travel patterns or behavior will remain pretty much the similar. And sometimes, of course, there will be some distinctive uh, other patterns as well. But for example, uh, like safety will be still the important criteria for travelers' decision making. And also people will try to also think of uh, online contents or something related to technological setting or online setting will be a great alternative option for the uh, actual travel experience. So because of this changing needs of consumers, the industry will need to actually keep an eye on their needs and understanding of their behaviors as well. And also government support will need to be ensured from the long-term perspectives. I see. Meanwhile, Ms. Kaval, one final question to you. Uh, Professor Bay spoke about Korea's relative success in containing COVID-19 earlier on compared to its counterparts worldwide. Do you believe this will perhaps boost Korea's image in the tourism industry? Well, I think as, as it was mentioned, safety and security are the biggest concern among consumers. So definitely that has an impact on the countries. And I think that is an added value that's very important. Um, I think also um, the fact that there has been um, an all-government approach to, to this pandemic is important because we do need to see a coordination among the different areas to make right. sure that, that we can actually have um, a return to, to safe travel. We're just talking about the, the vaccines before. And, you know, we have seen how hard it has been to have countries agreeing on testing. So we need to work now for when the vaccines are fully rolled out. Right. All right, Ms. Caval over in Spain, thank you very much for joining us at this very early hour. And Professor Peer here in the studio, thank you for being with us today. Thank you for having me. Right. My the, pleasure. The only way to ensure a recovery of the travel industry is to ensure a restraint of the pandemic. Having said that, do seek to abide by safety precautions wherever you are. Have a good weekend.